It's good to see you all today on Holy Day. You made your way into church and found us. So I'm glad of that. It is wonderful to be able to join in worship together. And I'm so glad that you're here. A few announcements, as always. It seems like I always have announcements. Uh, Limerick Council will meet tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. So I know none of the folks here in the building are at 7, but if anybody online uh, is watching us and you are part of council or you just like to know what council is all about, um, come and find us at the Limerick Church at 7 o'clock tomorrow. Uh, for those of you who are here in the person, you will see on your bulletin, and for those of you who are on the screen, you will see on the screen um, a little bit about the Star Words. This is from last week. We talked about having a, a word that might guide us this year that we might kind of come back to as the year goes on um, and wonder about how it plays into our lives. These are words that you chose last week out of the bucket with stars. Um, and, and the question is, um, for the, 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 the questions of the activities that are in your bulletin are not meant to be um, big and onerous or challenging or frightening or anything like that. They're just meant to uh, help us get um, a little bit of thinking. If you did not get a star, please let me know. I do have some more. I meant I meant for them that they're in the office. Um, so <laughs> I wondered if that's what you were looking for. <laughs> um, but I will get you one. Um, you will notice for the next few weeks there will be activities or questions that you get you thinking in the bulletin um, for a few weeks, and then after that we'll kind of come back to it once a month or so, um, and they will be. Uh, posted on the website or on um, the video as well as on the Facebook page. So if you're interested in that, I, I invite you to, to contemplate what your word is saying to you and what the spirit is saying to you through your word this year. Um, on that note of bulletins, my apologies uh, for those who are in person. The bulletins are a little wonky today. You have to look at the first page and then the last page and then the insert. Um, this is what happens when I do bulletins by myself and Joyce doesn't help me. Um, I, I printed them, I looked at them and went, oh crap, that's not right. And then decided not to waste the paper to reprint them. So, my apologies. Um, a thanks to Lori Chocha for doing tech for us today and Dwayne Wilson for playing music, especially Dwayne because I threw some difficult songs out in this week, so I appreciate that your effort on that in songs. Our music license number is A6091891 of one license LLC. We begin our worship as we always do this morning by acknowledging the territory. As we gather together this morning, it is with great respect that we acknowledge the history, spirituality, culture, and gifts of the peoples with whom Treaty 4 was signed and the Lakota Nation and Métis people who call this area home. We acknowledge the land on which we live, move, and work as a land that was first is still loved by those who care for and nurture Turtle Island. We acknowledge and accept our responsibilities as treaty members, and we pray that what we do here creates a space where all may work toward peace, friendship, and respectful relationships. May it be so. You'll notice that our call to worship Prayer of approach and confession and prayers of the people are all written by the Reverend Terry Peterson today. Um, you've heard me talk about the Bible Word podcast before, and they also put out a liturgy. Um, uh, and you know, normally you have to pay for it, but for January, they let anybody have it. And so uh, I read it through this week and went, Yeah, that pretty much does what I want to say, so why should I write it? And so we are using uh, Terry's words. Your response is uh, in bold for the cult of worship, as always, and it is the kingdom of heaven has come to you. The day is here. The way is revealed. 
The path is prepared and Christ leads us on. The Spirit pulls us close to whisper God's love and God's call. In our worship and in our lives, we proclaim, so Come, let us worship. We light our Christ candle today, remembering the light of the world that is in our lives, even on the darkest and foggiest of days. Let us pray. Loving Creator, as once you pulled back the veil of Jesus' baptism, we pray that you would do so again today, that we may at last recognize just how close you are. And when we have seen a glimpse of what brings you joy, open our hands and our hearts to do what pleases you most. Amen. Our first hymn is number 395 in Voices United. Come in, come in and sit down. Our range verse one, two, and four. Um, I teach you to stand to say, come in, come in and sit down. Let us join together in our prayer of confession. You have told us, O oh God, what is good, and we confess that we have strayed from your path. We have turned away from your when your way is difficult or inconvenient or uncomfortable. And we also confess that it's easy week after week to admit these purposeful diversions and ask for forgiveness, but harder to truly commit ourselves to turning back to you. For if we are fully honest, it is inattention and apathy that draw us away. We breathe the air of empire, and everywhere we look, the world encourages us to give in and give up. And we confess that sometimes we just don't have the energy to resist. Yet still, you reveal your kingdom of heaven among us. Still, you walk ahead of us on the path of justice and truth and compassion. Still, your love pours out and invites us to a different way of life. Forgive us for the ease with which we abandon that life you offer and the lazy shorthand we use to justify ourselves. 
Forgive us for holding on to the things you are trying to change while also refusing to put in work that would bear fruit. Reorient us once again this day and strengthen our resolve to put your love into action. We ask in the name of your beloved Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Friends, there is good news for us. There is nothing that separates us from the love of God. Nothing we can do, nothing we can say, nothing we can think, and nothing we cannot do or say or think that will take us away and outside the reach and the realm, the love and the forgiveness of God. This is good news for us that we are loved and we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. So in our scriptures, when we have the gospel readings, there are three gospels out of four that are um, very similar in, each, in their accounts. They're called the synoptic gospels. Uh, that is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Mark is the earliest, and then Matthew and Luke kind of stole stuff from Mark and added their own stuff. Uh, added something from another source called Q as well. And so when we look at our scriptures, we, we find that a lot of stories are in all three. And the story of Jesus' baptism is one of those ones that's in all three of the synoptic gospels. And so when I made the bulletin, your, I was planning to use Matthew. By the time I wrote the sermon, I decided to use Mark instead. So we're going to read from the book of Mark for the story of Jesus' baptism. So we read from Mark 1, 4 to 9. John the baptizer appeared in the wilderness, proclaiming the baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And people from the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. He proclaimed, that the one who is more powerful than I is coming after me. I am not worthy to stoop down and untie the thong of his sandals. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the Spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven. You are my son, the beloved. With you, I am well pleased. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. So, I love this particular piece of scripture. Because, and we'll talk about it a little bit in the sermon time, but God names Jesus as the beloved and throughout christian tradition that has been a name that has carried on for not only jesus but for all of us as well it's a name that has been passed down through the generations for all the faithful for for all who believe in jesus who all all who believe in god that we are beloved children of god and that is that is pretty amazing when you think about it, isn't it? Like, how cool is that? That the creator of all that is, the one who is called father and mother of all creation, that one says, you are my beloved children, calls and claims us. In, in our baptism ceremony, our, our sacrament of baptism, we talked about being called and claimed and commissioned. Called God's own, claimed by Christ and commissioned by the Holy Spirit to go out and share the good news of God throughout the world. That's amazing to me. And so today to help us remember that, I thought that I would bring us some name tags. Because 
names are important in the Bible, right? Every time, not every time, but lots of times when something significant happens, especially, well, not even just in the Old Testament, Paul gets in the air, Saul gets changed to Paul, Peter, right? He, he was Simon and he gets changed to Peter. Abram gets changed to Abraham. Jacob gets changed to Israel. These are important times in people's lives. And so, yes, it's important. God says, I have called you by your name. You are mine. God knows our names intimately and calls us by them. But God also calls us beloved. So I've made us name tags. We can change our names today. We can call each other beloved because that is what God calls us. And when you take it off of your shirt at the end of the day or when you get home and you change into your comfy clothes instead of your church clothes, put it somewhere where you'll see it. Put it on a piece of paper, put it on the mirror, put it on your bedside table, put it in your Bible. Put it somewhere where you will see it and you will remember that you are beloved of God because that is the greatest gift of all and something that should never be forgotten. And our next hymn is number three in more voices. That's the spiral bound book. It's called River. It is a new one to us, I believe. Um, Dwayne says it was new to him and I'm assuming it's new to the rest of us. Um, so have some fun with it, try it. If, if you feel like it's a little new and different, that's okay, it's supposed to be. is a relatively well-known one because we can read it in three of the four Gospels. We repeat it to ourselves as the basis of our sacrament of fourteen, right? That, that is where we get the idea 
that we should be baptized is because Jesus was baptized and um, we seek to follow in his footsteps. We color pictures of it when we're young in Sunday school or when we're with our younger family members. We instantly recognize the symbolism in the story, right? The, the, the water and the, the Jordan and John the Baptist, right? When we, when we hear about some guy eating locusts, we go, oh yeah, that's John the Baptist. He's, He's the crazy one who does that, right? Although, interesting enough, he does that because he is supposed to represent Elijah, who in the Old Testament also does that. But I, I wonder how much we've ever actually thought about the story and how much we know. It's kind of one of those stories, like the Christmas story, where we mush everything together, right? So the Christmas story, if, if you break up the Christmas story into the different Gospels, in Luke, you have the traveling to Bethlehem and the um, uh, and, and the stable and the shepherds. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew, that's where you get the magi. But on Christmas Eve, we tend to shove them all together for <laughs> when we tell the story, right? We match them up. And we do the same with the baptism stories. So they, they all kind of get pushed together. And so we recognize the symbols of them, but we couldn't tell you which one was out of which gospel. So let's have a little bit of Jeopardy. We'll play a little bit of a game here. What happens in the story? The story starts with John the Baptizer out by the Jordan River, baptizing people as they confessed and repented of their sins. He's preaching that there's going to be someone else coming to baptize him in a different way. Someone, depending on the translation, who is stronger or mightier or more powerful. And then Jesus shows up. And then this is where I start asking you questions. Then what happens? This is your part. According to Mark's gospel, the one we just read, I know I messed it, messed it up for you because we had a few things in between reading it and answering questions. But the one that we read today, what does John say to Jesus? The story of the baptism, what does John say to Jesus? You're right. Nothing. <laughs> Very good. You all, you all just stayed silent on that part. Okay, so bonus point. If you had read the Gospel of Matthew, anybody know what, is, what he says in the back of the Gospel of Matthew? John says to Jesus, uh-uh, I'm not going to baptize you. This isn't how this is supposed to go. He says, uh, you know, you, you should be baptizing me. You know, you, you are the one who's more powerful. This is not how this should go. Okay, so in, in the Gospel of Mark, we'll come back to the one we read today. What happens when Jesus comes up out of the water? He comes down. Heaven's open. One more. And God speaks. <laughs> we talked about that one already. I thought that would have been the easy one for you. Yeah. And God speaks, right? God says, you know, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. According to both Mark and Matthew, it's a little less clear in Luke's account. How many people see the heavens being torn open in the dove descent? In Mark and Matthew. Jesus. In Mark and Matthew, it, the way that it's written in the Greek is singular. Only Jesus sees us. In Luke, it's a little less clear. It might be that you know he sees some parts of it and hears some parts of it, and then um, that I think in Luke it's been a while since I've um, read the Greek on that one, but I think it's that he that he sees the dove and that everybody hears the voice. It might be the other way around though. Um, don't quote me on that one. But in, in this story, only Jesus sees the heavens ripped open and hears the voice saying, You are my beloved, which you know might have been nice for him to hear, also might have been nice for everybody else to hear, right? 
Like I can imagine him saying, come on, dad, like you couldn't say that to everybody. <laughs> Make it a little clearer for folks, you know, and, and when I'm gonna be going around preaching and teaching, it's gonna be better for me if you know I can say, hey, remember when I was baptized and <laughs> heaven's open and dad said. I ask these questions not to trick you, but well, maybe a little bit. <laughs> I'll admit, I have fun with, with Bible trivia, and so I think everybody should have fun with Bible trivia, but I may be mistaken on that part. I'll admit that. Um, but I, I ask it because the questions are important if we're going to learn something from the story. And it was really going to impact the way that the Bible could, and I would argue should, impact our lives. The fact is that though the people around Jesus may have known what was going on, may not have known what was going on, we have the benefit of hindsight, right? We look at the scriptures and say, oh yeah, this is how that story went. They might not have known what was going on, but we can look at it differently. And we should act like we know the story. We should act like we have seen it from out there. And, and the second part of what I think we need to learn is the first is that we have a benefit of hindsight, which should act on it. The second is that that's not, it's not supposed to be an easy process. It's not going to be an easy process. And that's okay, but we have to persevere in it anyways. So what do I mean by this? In the, the, the Gospel of Mark, there is a, there's a suggestion in biblical scholarship that says that there's a secrecy gospel in Mark. That according to Mark, um, Jesus does a lot of things that are in secret or that are told only to his disciples, that the, that the masses don't get the full picture of who he is until after the fact, until kind of like we are looking at it in hindsight. So according to Mark, John didn't know Jesus was the Messiah. In other scriptures, Jesus, John says, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the guy I've been talking about. In Mark, it doesn't even seem like they know each other, although they're cousins. So that begs the question. But, you know, it's possible to know that you're cousins with somebody and not know that they are, you know, somebody special outside of the family, right? You know, maybe, maybe you know that your Aunt Mary always said, oh, my son Jesus, he's going to save the world. And you're like, yeah, 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 Aunt Mary. Sure he is. <laughs> right? According to both Mark and Matthew, no one else saw the sky or the dove. It says that he saw, he perceived, not that they perceived or anything like that. And so this, this gospel, the secrecy gospel in Mark is that Jesus kept things secret until he was revealed to be the Messiah through his death and suffering. Therefore, the people in the story may not have known, but as Mark's readers, we do. We see Jesus come up to John and we say, come on, John, like, how do you not know this? Open your eyes, it's the one you've been talking about. We see that this is a huge part of the story, that, that Jesus took part in the same rituals that we do. But John just saw him as another guy coming to be baptized, and a long line of guys coming to be baptized. We see the dove and hear the voice. We see the heavens torn apart, and we realize that God is there reaching out, calling to us. So the question becomes, what do we do with that? Once, once we recognize it, once we know it. Because it's, it's not enough for us to say that we know that and then not do anything about it. When I was reading through some commentaries and lectionary preparation material this week, someone said, please do not turn this into a sermon about the benefits of baptism. This is about Jesus' baptism, not everyone else's. And in some ways, I agree with her. You know, I don't think this has to be the day that we talk about the theology of our suffering as it applies to us. But I do think that in some ways it is about us. Because we have to prepare the way like John did. We have to accept our humanity as Jesus did. And we have to proclaim Jesus as God's son, as God did in that story. Now, I'm not saying we have to go out there and beat people over the head with Bibles. But it 
does mean to make a difference in our lives. When we were baptized, either we made, if we were old enough, or our parents made on our behalf, promises for us at our baptism. Even if, even if we haven't been baptized, we've still committed ourselves to a Christian life in some way, right? Coming to church is one of those ways, and there's lots of others. So the question becomes, does, does what we do and say in our sacrament of baptism, does what we do and say in this place, in this community of faith on a weekly basis, on a daily basis, does that change the way that we see the world and prepare for God? Does it change our hearts? Does it change our community? Does recognizing not only Jesus' divinity, but also his humanity change the way that we follow him? lean on him or learn from him? Does it bring us comfort to know that he felt what we feel? Or does that scare the heck out of us? Does the fact that we claim him and proclaim him as God's son change things for us? That he's not just a, a great prophet, but he's also God come to earth in human form. What does it mean for us to say that we believe in Jesus Christ as the word made flesh, to proclaim him crucified and risen, our judge and our hope? Some days maybe it doesn't make much difference in our lives. Sometimes it doesn't for me. I know, you know, I, I'm not one who tries to go around converting people. I'm not opposed to telling people about my faith, but I don't tend to start every conversation with it. But it's not always a daily thing for me, right? And I don't, I don't always think about what I'm doing as it being in relationship to my faith. Although, you know, in more recent years, that conversation happens a lot more frequently when people figure out what I do. You know, it's like, hi, how are you? I'm, I'm nice to meet you. What do you do? Oh, I'm a minister. Okay, then. <laughs> you know, it's fun flying when, when you get to meet your seatmates. Every a professor who said that. Uh, you, you always end up with confession when you tell somebody that you're a minister. Either confession of, oh, I've done this wrong and I need to talk about it, or confession of, I don't go to church and here's why. And I'm like, I don't care if you go to church. Did I ask you if you go to church? But that's a whole different story. But sometimes, right, we, we forget. We don't, we don't let our faith impact what we do in, in direct ways. We start thinking about, you know, if I do good in, in a way, well, it's not so much because my faith tells me to, it's just my parents raised me right. I'm, I'm you know, a good person. And so um, I'm sure I, I don't lie, I don't steal, I don't do all these things because my parents taught me not to, not because my faith taught me not to. But then I remember that it is different, that I and you and our, our brothers and our sisters and our siblings throughout the church and in other religions who are who we are and do what we do by the grace and for the glory of God, or at least we should. We know who Jesus is. We know what, he, what was proclaimed about him and what we proclaim about him in our faith, and that should change us. It doesn't happen all at once, and you may not have ever thought about it quite this way before, or you may have thought about it quite a lot, and, you know, maybe what I'm saying today isn't anything new to you. But we're called to act as ones who know the end of the story. And sometimes that's not easy, because sometimes we don't see, even though we have the benefit of hindsight, sometimes we don't understand fully what is being said to us. You know, the heavens were torn apart, but not everyone got to see that again. But I, I like the story of the heavens being torn apart. It's really cool because in Greek, there's a perfectly good word for open, as in like you open a door or you open a can of tuna fish. This is not it. This is the word that is used for the tearing of the temple curtain when Jesus dies. It's the word that's used for the splitting of rocks in Matthew 27 when Jesus talks about tearing down the temple. 
It's the word that's used when it says that the fishing nets were not split when the, Jesus sends out the disciples to get a whole bunch of fish and the, the fish come or the nets come back full to bursting, but they do not split. These are stories about knowing God. This word shows up about knowing God. Because though sometimes God comes as a still, small voice, a lot of the time God is portrayed not in the, the, that still, small silence, but God is portrayed in a mighty wind or fire, right? God, God is portrayed in these big things. God does not come quietly. And in this story, it's almost like, and I, I love this idea, that God is so excited that Jesus is baptized. God is so excited to proclaim Jesus as God's son that God rips open the heavens like wrapping paper on a child's Christmas gifts. Have you ever seen that? I, my sister used to do it all the time. Christmas morning, I'd be taking one little piece off and going and handing it to my parents, take another one off, hand it to my parents, and my grand or my sister would be coming and ripping it. <laughs> she would be done all of her presents before I was done one. God is so excited as to just rip open the heavens. And that is amazing. God wants to be there, wants to see it all, wants to tell us all who Jesus is and what he will do. And God is calling us to do the same. And sometimes that's hard because we don't want to get labeled as crazy, right? We don't want to be labeled as those religious people. So we end up saying nothing at all. We're afraid that if we push too much, we'll offend someone who doesn't believe the same as us. But that's not necessarily what it's about. It's about finding those moments when God tears the heavens apart to show us something, whether that be the sunrise that makes you believe in the beauty of God's creation, the phone call from a friend which reminds you of God's love, or the silence of prayer and contemplation when you can really hear God saying, you are my beloved. With you, I am well pleased. It's these times that we look for and allow to change us. Each time we recognize God in these moments of tearing, we are changed for the better. So my challenge for us all this week is to search for God in the little things and in the big things. And then to let, us change, let it change us. Let God remind you who you are and why you do what you do. For we are children of God, each of us a beloved child, and God is eager, 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 eager to tear open that wrapping paper and tell us that. The wrapping of our lives, God wants to tear it down and know us personally. And for that, we are well pleased. And that is good news. Amen. As people of the United Church, we proclaim our faith in the words of a new creed. So I invite you to join with me as we say these words together. We are not alone. We live in God's world. We believe in God who has created and is created who has come in Jesus, the word made flesh, to reconcile and make new, who works in us and others by the Spirit. We trust in God. We are called to be the church, to celebrate God's presence, to live with respect and creation, to love and serve others, to seek justice and resist evil, to proclaim Jesus crucified and risen, our judge and our hope. In life, in death, in life beyond death, God is with us. We are not alone. Thanks be to God. Right. We have been given so many gifts. And so we give back to our God now out of all that we have and all that we are. We give our time and our talents and our treasure. Whatever it is that you offer this day, I invite you to think about it now as we sing our offertory hymn, as it's printed in your bulletin, as with gladness men of all verse three.
God, these are the gifts that you first gave to us. And so we give them back to you now as a token of the love that we have for you. May they be used to further your work in this church and in the world around us. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Your kingdom come, O oh God, we pray. We ask, yet rarely look for the answer, consigning heaven to some other time and some other place. Today we pause in that prayer, asking first for the blessing of meeting what we say. Your kingdom come on earth, O oh God. For the world needs us to pray with purpose and to listen when you answer by calling us back to your way. The situation is urgent. We are struggling to keep up with all the needs, and we may finally be ready for the upheaval that will come when you break in, disrupting our systems of domination and control and greed. Reveal your kingdom of justice, where your abundance is enough for everyone, where no one starves while others gorge themselves, where all are loved for themselves and not for how they can serve another. Where who we know or where we went to school or what people think of our names no longer determines our station or work. Reveal your kingdom of peace, where no parent needs to flee with their children, where the air is filled with bird song instead of sirens with guns, where homes are safe and each person is respected, where our words build up rather than tear down. Reveal your kingdom of compassion, where community cares for each other, where we hold one another accountable with grace, where there is space for each person to let go of what holds them back as they grow and bear fruit that you have made them to bear. Reveal your kingdom of love, where we can face difficult things by standing in your strength, where we value your priorities even when they are not profitable where blessing flows in every direction. Gather us in the kingdom of heaven and give us courage to commit to walking with you. We ask in the name of Jesus the Christ, as we continue in the words he taught us, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn this morning is number 380 in Voices United, She Comes Sailing on the Wind.
Friends, as you go from this place, may the spirit fly within your soul. May you go knowing that the secrecy gospel is no longer secret in our lives or in the lives of others. And so may you go proclaiming the love of God for each and every one that we are all called the beloved. And as you go, may you go with the blessing and the love of God, who is our creator, our redeemer, and our sustainer. Jesus, who is our elder brother, the Holy Spirit of life within you this day and evermore. Amen. <laughs>